Section 68 of Women of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Women of History by Anonymous. Section 68. Meta Moller. 1750. Letters. Klopstock first beheld Meta Moller in passing through Hamburg in April 1751. In a letter to one of his friends, written soon after this, he describes her as mistress of the French, English, and Italian languages, and even conversant with Greek and Latin literature. She was then in her twenty-fourth year, he in his twenty-seventh. Their marriage took place about three years afterwards. Here is Meta's own narrative of the rise and course of their true love, given in one of her letters to Richardson, a narrative which will bear a hundred readings and a hundred more after that, and still be as fresh and as touching as ever. You will know all what concerns me. Love, dear sir, is all what me concerns and love shall be all what I will tell you in this letter. In one happy night I read my husband's poem, The Messiah. I was extremely touched with it. The next day I asked one of his friends who was the author of this poem, and this was the first time I heard Klopstock's name. I believe I fell immediately in love with him. At the least, my thoughts were ever with him filled, especially because his friend told me very much of his character but I had no hopes ever to see him, when quite unexpectedly I heard that he should pass through Hamburg. I wrote immediately to the same friend for procuring by his means that I might see the author of the Messiah when in Hamburg. He told him that a certain girl in Hamburg wished to see him, and for all recommendation showed him some letters in which I made bold to criticize Klopstock's verses. Klopstock came and came to me, I must confess that though greatly prepossessed of his qualities, I never thought him the amiable youth whom I found him. This made its effect. After having seen him for two hours, I was obliged to pass the evening in a company which never had been so wearisome to me. I could not speak, I could not play, I thought I saw nothing but Klopstock. I saw him the next day and the following, and we were very seriously friends but the fourth day he departed. He wrote soon after, and from that time our correspondence began to be a very diligent one. I sincerely believed my love to be friendship. I spoke to my friends of nothing but Klopstock, and showed his letters. They rallied me, and said I was in love. I rallied them again, and said that they must have a very friendshipless heart if they had no idea of friendship to a man as well as to a woman. Thus it continued eight months, in which time my friends found as much love in Klopstock's letters as in mine. I perceived it likewise, but I would not believe it. At the last Klopstock said plainly that he loved, and I startled as for a wrong thing. I answered that it was no love but friendship, as it was what I felt for him. We had not seen one another enough to love, as if love must have more time than friendship. This was sincerely my meaning, and I had this meaning till Klopstock came again to Hamburg. This he did a year after we had seen one another for the first time. We saw, we were friends, we loved, and we believed that we loved, and a short time after I could even tell Klopstock that I loved. But we were obliged to part again and wait two years for our wedding. My mother would not let me marry a stranger. I could marry then without her consentment, as by the death of my father my fortune depended not upon her. But this was an horrible idea for me, and thank heaven I have prevailed by prayers. At this time, knowing Klopstock, she loves him as her lifely son, and thanks God that she has not persisted. We married, and I am the happiest wife in the world. This was written in March 1758, after they had been about four years married. Writing again in the beginning of May, she thus sketches the life they led together. It will be a delightful occupation for me to make you more acquainted with my husband's poem. Nobody can do it better than I, being the person who knows the most of that which is not yet published, being always present at the birth of the young verses, which begin always by fragments here and there of a subject of which his soul is just then filled. He has many great fragments of the whole work ready. 
you may think that persons who love as we do have no need of two chambers. We are always in the same. I, with my little work, still only regarding sometimes my husband's sweet face, which is so venerable at that time with tears of devotion and all the sublimity of the subject, my husband reading me the young verses and suffering my criticism. With this we may compare what Klopstock says writing of her. How perfect was her taste! How exquisitely fine her feelings! She observed everything, even to the slightest turn of the thought. I had only to look at her, and could see in her face when even a syllable pleased or displeased her. And, when I led her to explain the reason of her remarks, no demonstration could be more true, more accurate, or more appropriate to the subject. But, in general, this gave us very little trouble, for we understood each other when we had scarcely began to explain our ideas. But all this happiness, too bright for earth, or for long endurance, was about to be suddenly extinguished. There is another letter, from Meta to Richardson, dated 26th August, in which she informs him that she has a prospect of being a mother in the month of November and of thus attaining what has been her only wish ungratified for these four years. She writes from Hamburg, where she was on a visit to her family, while her husband had been obliged to make a journey to Copenhagen. It was the first time that they had been separated. It is remarkable that she seems to have had more than a mere apprehension, almost an assured foreboding of what awaited her. Klopstock rejoined her at the last about the end of September. Her last lines, written to him before his return, are dated the 26th of that month. The two following months they spent together at Hamburg. From that place poor Meta was never to return. There, where she had first drawn breath, she died in childbed on the 28th of November. Klopstock lived till 1803, and was then buried under a lime tree in the churchyard of Ottensen, near Altona by the side of his Meta and the child that slept in her arms. End of section 68